Good morning, Kanan. And thank you to our veterans one more time. I'm Cindy Christopher, and I currently serve as uh, one of your minist women's ministry leaders. And because I have the microphone, I'd like to invite all of the women and their friends to our Hearts and Homes Joy-Filled Conference. It's next weekend. It's November 15th and 16th. It'll be Friday evening until about 1 o'clock on Saturday, so you'll still have the balance of your day. You will get to choose from 20 workshops and demonstrations and one of five make-and-take options for updating your place or for gifting. Topics are all things holiday, both fall and Christmas, including ideas to gift your neighbors, as well as sharing the gift of love in Christ. This weekend is the last opportunity to sign up. You can do that after the service today at CanaanSTL.org, and we look forward to having you join us next weekend. Today, our scripture reading is from 1 Thessalonians 4, 9-12. through 12. Please stand for the reading of God's Word. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Sandy. All right. Well, if you didn't open your Bible up to First Thessalonians 4, go ahead and do so, because we'll be camping out there um, as we continue our series through the book of First Thessalonians. And um you know, the kind of the main theme of this whole book is about the importance of holiness. And uh, just want to stress again, the, the big thought of this whole series, right, is why, is it, why isn't it so important for us to pursue living a life of personal holiness? It's not in order to gain something we don't have, right? We don't try to live a holy life, try to be good people, try to pursue righteousness in order to try to somehow earn curry favor from God, Right. We pursue a life of holiness. We pursue righteousness because God has already placed righteous and holiness into our account, so to speak, right? So when Jesus died on the cross, he took our sins from us. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 21 says that he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to become our sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, right? So when Jesus died on the cross and we place our faith and trust in him, this amazing, beautiful event happens where our sinfulness, all of it, our shame, our sin, our approach was imputed, placed within the account, so to speak, of Jesus. And in turn, his righteousness, his holy standing with the Father was imputed into our account through faith. Isn't that a great deal? So that now when the Heavenly Father looks at us, for those of us who are in Christ, that's why we're called in Christ, the Father sees Jesus, not the yuck and nastiness of our sin. So now we're called to, since we have this great gift, this amazing salvation, we're called to live it out. You know, we're called to be imitators of Christ. We're called to become more and more like Christ. We're called to pursue holiness, to work out what's been worked in us. And so that's the really the process of sanctification, which we talked about last week, is that process by which God makes us more and more into the image of Jesus. So our lifestyle more and more matches the standing we have with the Father in our justification. So a lot of theology there, but it's good stuff, amen? Isn't that great? Isn't that great news? The gospel is beautiful. And so as we've been going through this book of 1 Thessalonians, Paul is teaching the church that, and he, he kind of lifts them up as an exemplary church um, in all of the area of Macedonia. And the primary reason is because of their pursuit of holiness. And so he's been teaching on that, but no matter how good you are, you can always get better because all of us are in this process of being made more and more like Jesus, and we've all got a ways to go, amen? So just turn to your neighbor and remind them, you still got a ways to go, right? Even if you've been following Jesus for five plus decades, we still have a ways to go. Here in the life of the church, Thessalonian church was doing great things. God, I mean, again, Paul's lifting them up as an ex a good example of a church, but now Paul's teaching them, hey, what you're doing, you need to do more and more, which is a great thing for us. You know, we need to be, whatever you're doing, if you think you're doing well, tracking along with Jesus, what can you do better? 
If you think you're a good husband, what does it take to be a great husband? If you think you're a good dad, what does it mean to be a great dad? If you think you're a great connection group leader, Bible study teacher, what does it mean to be a great one? You know, pursue the glory of God in all things. Do all things for the glory of God, Paul tells us in Colossians. So that's kind of the gist of what Paul's getting at here in our text today. But it reminds me of, of something from my past. So when I was eight years old, I started playing football. Anybody play football as a kid? Just a few of us, huh? All right, not many. Well, here's a snapshot of eight-year-old Daniel with, uh, with his dad. My dad. My dad was my coach. And uh, first team I played for was the Packers. That's why I love the Green Bay Packers to this day. Uh, first team I played for. Anyway, we had a really good team. The year before, we had won the championship in our little hometown, right? Well, my dad, the very first practice, he got us all together, you know, in a little huddle. And he called us men, which I love that. Here were eight to 10-year-olds. He's calling us men. He says, all right, men, now listen up. Last year, we had a great season. But I'm going to set some goals for us this season. Because, yes, we were good last year. We're going to be better this year. And so he laid out these goals. First goal was win the championship. Second goal was to go undefeated. Third goal is we're going to score at least 21 points every game. And the fourth goal is we're not going to allow a single touchdown scored against us all season long. And you know what? We looked at each other thinking he's halfway crazy. But also like, hey, maybe we can do this. So man, we began the season. First game, we won 21 to nothing. Second game, we won 28 to nothing. Third game, we won 35 to nothing. We make it through the whole season to the very last game. We're undefeated. We've scored at least 21 points every game, and we've allowed zero touchdowns. Last game of the season, it gets to the fourth quarter, and we're like in the huddle going, hey, we're really going to do this, right? So we scored a touchdown and put it up like 20, I think it was like 21, 28 to nothing, and we kicked off. And they had this one boy, John, John Johnson, man, never forget him. He caught that ball. He takes off running, and he scored a touchdown on the kickoff in the fourth quarter of the very last game of the season. But hey, let me tell you, that was a great team. We had been good before, but we were great that season. It was incredible to be a part of that, right? So what's the point? No matter how good we are, we can always get better. So Paul's message to Thessalonian church is to do this more and more, become imitators. So here's the big thought, how this is going to apply to us today, the same way it applied to the Thessalonian church. As we grow in holiness, we're going to grow in loving insiders, that's church family, and outsiders, that's those who aren't part of the church yet, more and more. You can see that progression all through the language here in First Thessalonians. So again, you know, how do you become better at what you're doing and who you are in Jesus Christ? It's a, it's a huge thing. So this is the big thought. So let's just dive right in. How can we do this? How can we become better? How can we grow more and more, especially when it comes to our love. What we're looking at today is one great manifestation of our growth in holiness is our love we have for one another. It's intimately tied together. You can't say that you're you're growing in holiness and following Jesus and loving Jesus more and more if you're not growing in love for other people more and more. Those are intimately connected, right? Right? Amen? Tracking with me? I don't see a lot of heads going up and down. Yeah. What What a timely message too. I mean, aren't you glad the elections are over? Woo, man, I just bemoan the fact that Amendment 3 passed. That was very unfortunate. But we just got all the more work to do. But we love, that's what we are, it's who we are, it's who Jesus is. God is love. And so we must be those who love also. And so we need to grow in that. Well, here, what's he, what does he tell the Thessalonians? Here in verse 9, he says, Concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. So here's an interesting truth. We are, have been, and are being taught to love by God himself. This is incredible. So, so God is the teacher of love. And so first he instructs us on love. He, he teaches us what love is. You know, what is love? Is love that emotional kind of butterfly feeling you get when, remember the first time you, you met your person, if you're married, the first person who's now your spouse, remember the first time you met and you know, maybe it was attraction. How many of you was love at first sight? Raise your hand if it was love at first sight. <laughs> yeah, I had a prompter over there, you know. Uh, 
<laughs> well, anyway, yeah, I mean, that happens, right? That immediate, oh, this is great. Now, what does that mean? I mean, there's this attraction, there's this connection, and you, you just kind of know, right? Is that, what, is that what this is talking about? Is that what love is according to God and his word? Well, Scripture, he tells us God is always clear in what we need to know. Here's what love is. He defines it for us, 1 Corinthians 13. This is not just a marriage passage, although it's read in most weddings. It's a great passage to read. But really, the context of this passage, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, Paul is writing to the church about what goes on in the church. So this is really to us in the church, right? How we should show love to one another. Love is patient. Love is kind right? Love does not envy, does not boast. It is not arrogant. It's not rude, does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And the verse, the first sentence of the next verse, verse A says, love never fails or never ends. This is God's definition of love. He is instructing us. Which, so what does this mean? Just, just think back to this week, right? It shows how far we still have to go. How have we failed to love someone this week? Have you, been, have you been impatient with someone this week? I know I have. Have you been unkind to someone this week? Have you boasted this week? Have you been, have you been irritable this week, right? Well, you're just, I'm not stepping on toes now. I'm meddling, right? This is, it shows our, how far we have to go, right? Our depravity still comes out. We need Jesus. Like we sang, we don't just need him to be justified at one moment in time. Like we talked last week, we, we need him every moment of every day, continue to grow in us more and more and more like Jesus. He instructs us. Secondly, he commands us to love. love loving your, your neighbor, loving one another, it's not an option. It's not a suggestion, right? It is a command to you and to me from the King of Kings, the creator, sustainer of all the universe. He says above all things to love him and love each other. That's like number one and number two. And really it all goes together because you can't love God and not love people. So it's really just one thing, to love one another. Jesus commands his disciples in us this is, look how clear this is. This is my commandment, that you love one another. And it even gives us a measurement the same way that I have loved you. So are you loving each other, right? Yes, in your home, but in the church family too. Are you loving one another in the same way Jesus loves the church, that he has loved us, that he has loved you? You just unpack that. What has Jesus done for you? He's forgiven you of all of your sins. So if you're not forgiving someone, are you loving them like Jesus loved you? No. So ask the Lord to help you get there, right? It's a process. Are you, are you being kind to everyone the same way Jesus is kind to you? He's kind to us. His kindness, Bible says that God's kindness leads us to repentance, right? That kindness is so important. So the commandment there is to love one another. But now that he models love for us, he shows us what it looks like. In the person of Jesus and giving Jesus, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. See, Romans 5, 8, for God shows, demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the great news of the gospel, is that God loves you just like you are right now. Amen? I've, said, I've heard it so many times. Well, God can't love me because I've just done this, this, and this. God loves you as much right now as he ever has and ever will. And no one will ever love you more. His love for you is not based on what you have done or what you haven't done. It's based on the fact that he created you and he knows you. He tells Jeremiah, before you were in the womb, I knew you, right? He knows you, he loves you. Uh, Ephesians 2.10 says, we are his workmanship, his creation, right? To do good works which he prepared for us in advance. He loves you. There's nothing you have done that's beyond the love of God. Say nothing with me. Nothing. No thing that you could do to remove you from the love of God. There's only one thing that condemns us to eternal condemnation, and that's not receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Did you know that? 
If you read John 3, right after verse 16, go down to verse 18, and it says, He who believes is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not trusted in the name of the only begotten Son. That's it. Notice Jesus in that conversation didn't mention the sin part, right? We're all condemned. We're sinners. We're all condemned because of sin, but we're condemned because we don't trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's the only thing that condemns us. So if you trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and follow him, you're saved. You don't have to clean yourself up first. That's the good news of this passage, Romans 5, 8. That's God's love. He's demonstrating that. First John chapter four, verse nine. In this, the love of God is made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, clear. That's so clear. Not that we've loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He modeled that love. Love is sacrificial. Love takes the initiative. I mean, all these things about love, God has done for us. And lastly, he empowers us to love. God knows that there's this huge gap between perfect agape, unconditional love and us, right? There's a big gap there. Yeah, we strive, we aspire, we grow, we're being sanctified and we're, you know, we're inching closer. There's still this huge gap, right? Well, God empowers us to be able to love, to be able to love as he loves. John 15, verse five, here's Jesus kind of gives us and the, and the disciples here kind of the, the secret sauce, so to speak. He says, I am the vine, you're the branches. So Jesus is the vine, the main trunk. We are the branches connected. Whoever abides in him and he in us, it's he, us, that bears much fruit. But apart from him, we can do what? Nothing. So how is it that we grow and can bear fruit and, and do the things he's commanded us to do? So we abide in Jesus. This is why we're over and over. We always encourage you to spend daily time with Jesus. Spend time in the word. Spend time praying. It's so important to be regular in your, in your participation, in the body life of the church, connection groups, worship, serving in ministry, because all that's part of abiding. All that's part of staying connected to the vine. So important. And then Paul reminds us in Philippians 2, it's God who works in you, both to will, that's the want to, right? And to work, that's the doing, for his good pleasure. So when you're saved, when you're born again, when you're justified, you receive the Holy Spirit within you. And he empowers you to do things that you can normally can never do. To be obedient, you want to be obedient. You want to love people. You want to serve God. Those, your want to changes when you come to faith in Christ. But we're taught by God. And as we're taught by God, we grow more and more in our love. First, we love the insider. So Paul is clear in his language. This isn't kind of popular language in our day and age, but there's insiders and there's outsiders, just the way it is, right? There are those who are in the body of Christ, in the church through faith in Jesus Christ. And there are those who are not part of the church yet because they have not trusted in Jesus Christ yet. And I stress the yet because it's our, our calling, our privilege to take the gospel to the nations so they become insiders. We want all outsiders to become insiders, amen? Oh, you gotta say it like you believe it. We want all outsiders to become insiders, amen? So the insiders, we gotta go outside to make that happen. So that's what we do. But we gotta love the insiders, the church family. So there's, there's two expressions how we understand the church. The first is we love our local church family. For us here as members, it's Canaan Baptist Church. We're called to love each other, to serve each other. Um, this local church is, is, is just a, a big deal. In fact, your love and your, how you care, care for each other within the local church is even a litmus test for the genuineness of your faith. I mean, John says it like this in 1 John 3. He says, we know. That's, a, that's an emphatic. That's a, we know, like there is certainty. We know we have passed out of death, outside, into life, inside, because we love the brothers. So if you have a genuine love for brothers and sisters in Christ in the local church context, that is strong evidence that you truly have been born out of death into life. Amen. It's a good, 
First John's full of tests. If you're like ever curious, man, I just don't know if I'm really saved or not. One, I'd love to talk with you. But two, First John's a great book to go to. It's filled with all these kind of tests of the genuineness of our faith. But that's the test. Romans 12, Paul teaches about loving each other. He says, let love be genuine, right? Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection. And I love this, outdo one another in showing honor. A little competition. You know, what if you made it kind of competitive to outdo each other in honor? Anybody competitive in here? Raise your hand. Yeah. I'm way, I'm too competitive for my own good. You know, like yesterday playing pickleball with, with my family, I was tempted to get so mad because one of them is just an absolute rule follower. That just drove me crazy. Anyway, I digress. I'm still bitter about it a little bit. Anyway, we we just, we get real competitive, you know, but, but this can be in a good way. Outdo each other in showing honor. That's how much we should love each other. So when it comes to loving each other, this is why church membership is such an important biblical issue. Membership matters. It matters. So why should I be a member of a local church? It's kind of a common thing in the last 50 years in our American church culture to kind of shift into church shopping, church hopping, church consumerism, if you will, traveling around from church to church, seeing all the the good stuff different churches are doing, but also seeing the the the, the good things they don't do. You know, we're just kind of, we're kind of in a consumeristic mindset. Why is that a problem biblically long term? Well, let's look at why be a member of a local church. Some biblical reasons, first of all, the most important. Number one, Christ is committed to his church. Therefore, as we grow in Christ's likeness, we should be too. Ephesians 5 reminds us that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Secondly, we are commanded to live out the one another's. We call them the one another's. 37, at least 37 commands in the New Testament are given to us on how we are to interact with each other as part of the church. Like, Love one another. Whoops, I skipped one. Yeah, beloved, let us love one another. Love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, rebuke, exhort, and teach one another. I mean, there's just so many commands on how we are to interact with one another that you cannot do if you're not part of a local church family. And so it's just a huge part of our own walk with the Lord. But secondly, we're commanded, uh, we need accountability. Accountability is, is a huge piece here. We all need it. Accountability is something that none of us really want in our flesh, but we need accountability. Like how many of you, you love to go to the doctor? I can't wait to get that colonoscopy, right? You, I mean, whatever. We just, there's all these horrible things we put ourselves through. Why, why do we do that? Because we know that we need some kind of physical accountability, right? We, we're, we go to make sure our body's doing the things our body's supposed to do. And that's just part of the physical accountability. Don't you think we need that spiritually too? I mean, be honest. Do we really need spiritual accountability? Yes, because our spiritual life is even more important than our physical life. I mean, our bodies are, are dying, but our spirits, if you're in Christ, are growing and living. And it's just a powerful thing. So we got to make sure we're addressing the needs of our spiritual life even more so than we are our physical life. And so accountability is so, and there's, there's so many scriptures about accountability. Hebrews 13, 17 talks about how all of us, even the leaders need accountability. Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that wouldn't be of no advantage to you. So we'll be accountable to one another. So, I mean, what if, what if everyone was just a church consumer and no one ever committed to any one congregation? What would that look like? Well, we wouldn't have a worship team because no one's committed to it, right? We wouldn't have a nursery because no one's committed to loving on our babies and, you know, changing diapers in the name of Jesus, which is a really holy thing. You know, no one would work with their teenagers. No one would be preaching. I mean, it'd be, we wouldn't have a church. Without commitment of God's people to God's kingdom and his, and the church, there is no church. It wouldn't happen. We have to be committed. The only reason that churches exist is because people realize, okay, look, no church is perfect. We say that all the time. No church is perfect. But I'm going to commit myself to serving Jesus here. So if by chance you're here today or watching online and you are not a committed member of any church yet, let me encourage you 
to find one. Find one where the word of God is preached unashamedly, where they use the word inerrant, infallible with no problem. Look for that church. Look for churches where you can leverage your gifts and your abilities for God's glory and God's kingdom. Because God has made you exactly who you are for a purpose. You've got skills, you've got giftings and talents that the church needs, that the church uses, and you're, you're a vital part, right? So look for the church where you fit and plug in, go all in, because Jesus is all in. Secondly, it's a cultural reason. Joining a church family goes in the opposite direction that our culture is going. Our culture has been going for years in a non-committal direction, right? Um, We're just not committed to many things like we used to be. We're not committed to marriages as much as we used to be. We're not committed to God's definition of family like we used to be. We're not committed uh, to, gosh, you just name it. You throw it in there. You know, we just celebrated our veterans. We're not committed as a country like we once were, right? I mean, you just throw it in. It's just, it's kind of the immoral slash amoral plunge our whole culture has taken. Well, this is an antidote for that. Anytime you make a commitment to a good cause, it's a good thing. Third, a practical reason. For us, it simply defines who can be counted on? You know, every, every uh, business has an employment. Every team has a roster. Every school has an enrollment. Um, the army has an enlistment. You know, got to serve. Pleasure to do that. Even our country takes a census every 10 years. So it's just a practical thing for us. We know we can identify who our family is. And lastly, it's a personal reason. Produces spiritual growth. When you commit to a local body of, of church, of Christ followers, to use your gifts, to use your talents for the glory of God, it's going to produce growth in you. You're going to become more and more aware that you're not here just for yourself. You're here to serve the Lord and to serve others. And that's a good thing. It's a holy thing. So church membership brings in all of that. So we love the insiders of our local church family. We also love our global church family. So the church is also the global church. Like today, right now, God's church is meeting all over this planet. That's a pretty awesome thought. Um, So here we see in the text, Paul says, look, for indeed, he he brags on them, encourages them, for yours has been taught by God to love one another, for that indeed is what you're doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. So now it's not just about the church in Thessalonica, it's also all the churches in Macedonia. So just to give you a reference, here's a map. You love maps, and I love maps. I love it. So it's kind of small, but up there in the middle top, you see the city of Thessalonica. It's kind of on the southern coast of the region, the province known as Macedonia. So when Paul is saying to the church of Thessalonica, what you've done has been impactful to all the churches in Macedonia. He's talking about the churches in Berea, um, Larissa, uh, Amphipolis, Philippi, Neapolis. All those cities had churches in it, started by Paul and others, that because of the church in Thessalonica, these churches were being positively impacted because of the love of the Thessalonian church. Pretty awesome. In fact, over in 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and he uses all the Macedonian churches as an example, probably led by the Thessalonian church. He says in verse chapter 8, verse 1, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in relief of the saints. So what happened was there was some churches that were really, really struggling because of persecution, because of poverty. They were just struggling. So the churches in Macedonia, again, most likely led by Thessalonia, they rounded up some money, some plies, whatnot, even though they too were poor, they too were afflicted. They were having a lot of the same issues, but they loved the brothers and sisters in this distant church and they helped them immensely. So much of that Paul is raising them up as an example to all the churches in the whole area. Pretty incredible. The love for the insiders, even if they're on the other side of the planet. Which brings us to number three. We're also called to love the outsiders, those who aren't inside yet. And so here Paul gives us some very particular teachings on this. And we're to love the outsiders. We want them to become insiders. This is why we're 
loving the church locally and globally, right? Is to empower the church locally and globally, but to also get the outsiders in. I mean, right now it's just exciting. You know, right now we have, um, we partnered uh, with the Nations Initiative, which is, we started that as our missions ministry, started off as Canaan Global, but it's grown. So now it's Nations Initiative. Did you know right now we have, we have over 200 churches, church plants in our network of, Can- of to get to the Nations Initiative? Isn't that exciting? 200 churches it's in Senegal, it's in Zambia, Malawi, uh, coming in Liberia, We've got a church plant in Nepal. I mean, it's just exciting. Uh, 12 schools through partnership with Bethlehem Christian Academy with over 2,000 students. Why? Because we love the church globally, but we also want outsiders to become insiders. You know, and, and right now we have um, one of the missionaries we, we work with there in Senegal. He works hand in hand with Boss. He's from Mali. Now, if you know, if you keep up with Africa's stuff, right? Mali is a heavily Islamic country and has become hostile, particularly to Christians. Well, our missionary that's in Senegal, he feels called to go to Mali, back to his home to take the gospel there. So we need to be praying for him, but we also continue to support him because this is what we do, right? Is it worth our lives to others to get the gospel? Absolutely. Because guys, we have all eternity to live and be together forever, right? But what we do now matters so much. And that's what holiness does. Holiness loves, therefore takes the gospel where the gospel is needed because we love the outsider. And how do we do that? So here Paul gives some very clear instruction to the Thessalonian church on how to love the outsider. First is to live quietly. Look what he says here in verse, um, verse 11. And to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands so we instruct you so you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one live quietly and here what he means is, is have a holy ambition have a what's what's your aim what's your goal what do you want to attain right when you as you progress in life you know what's what's your motivation and here for paul you know he kind of flips our understanding of ambition on his head when we think of ambition we think of climbing the social ladder the corporate ladder getting promoted making our name big becoming famous becoming rich whatever right being the next great pro quarterback or what whatever it is in your field that's what we think of ambition but here paul says look let your holy ambition let your aim let your aspiration right be a quiet life living quietly so what is what does he mean by living quietly? Does that mean we just, we don't get involved? We, we, we kind of re- recluse ourselves? No, not, a, not at all. Our ambition is to live peaceful, live a God-honoring life, free from unnecessary drama, unnecessary conflict. Not a passive life, but a life that reflects maturity. But we don't need the world's recognition because we are secure in God's love and his purpose for us. A quiet lifestyle, um, you know, is, is, is not one that promotes self, it, but promotes Jesus and love. Secondly, he says, mind our own affairs. This is kind of living with a holy focus. And that focus is not on self. Since our identity is in Christ, God calls us to reject the urge to make ourselves the center of attention, but instead to bring others' focus to Jesus, to be about the gospel. And as we draw closer to him in quiet obedience, we let our lives be quietly powerful testimonies of his grace and goodness. And then he says, working with our hands so we can be generous to others. So here's interesting. If you look in the context here of 1 Thessalonians, where we're about to go. What Paul's about to talk about next is the return of Christ. Christ is return. I mean, he's coming, right? Amen. We believe that. He's coming. Well, for a lot of the Thessalonians, they believe that so much. They believed that Christ was going to come back any day now. So some of them were were quitting their jobs and just living off of each other in the church, right? They were like, well, hey, Jesus might come back by Friday, so it's going to be good. So I'm done. I'm not going to work anymore. I'm going to chill out, and I'm going to wait. Well, here we are 2,000 years later, right? So what was happening, that was putting an unnecessary burden on others. And here's kind of the moral of that story. Laziness is not loving. Laziness is selfish, right? And so you had these few people using, leveraging this imminent return of Jesus as a crutch to be lazy and not go to work. 
So Paul saying, no, 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 we need to work. We need to work with our hands. Another thing in there, the Greek people, they thought manual labor was beneath them. Manual labor was for the slaves. It was for the, the, the oppressed. It was for those that they had conquered and subjugated. It wasn't for them. Paul is turning that upside down, right side up. Also saying, no, work is good. Work is holy. Work with your hands. Again, Paul had emulated that. He even tells them, work with your hands as we instructed you. Because work is good. So he turned all that. Because working is loving. You're loving your community. You're loving your family. You're loving your neighbors as you work to make the world a better place, doing whatever it is that you do. So, More and more, do these things, love insiders, love outsiders. But the big question for all of us today, what is it that God has kind of raised up in your heart, in your mind today that you need to do better at? How do you need to grow more and more? How do you need to excel a little bit more? How do we as a church family need to do a little bit better and a little bit better? What's the thing for you in your individual life? I mean, do you need to be a better dad? You need to be a, a more attentive husband or wife. You need to be a, a better employee. I mean, are you the kind of employee that goes to your job and, man, you're just the first one to complain and gripe and all that sort of thing? Remember, that all reflects upon the Lord, too. Do all things. Just say all things with me. All things. Do all things as unto the Lord, right? So where do you need to grow? What is your next step? Maybe it's in your faith journey. Maybe you're as you're here today or watching online, you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is your next step. Take that to take that step. Say, I believe. I don't want to be an outsider, right? I don't want to be condemned because I haven't trusted in Jesus. I want to, I, I believe. I, I want to be in. I, I trust in Jesus Christ with all my heart. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe for some of you, you've taken that step, but you've never been baptized. We're having a baptism service November 24th. If you want to be baptized, if you believe that's your next step, we'll talk about that, but go ahead and there's a place you can sign up for that on the, on the app. Just do that and we'll get in contact. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe a lot of your next step is you've, you're not a member of a local church. And let me, I would love for you to be a member of Canaan, but you got to go where God's called you to go. But that's your next step is to plug in, be committed, go all in with a church family. You will not regret that. Whatever your next step is, Take it today. Don't waste time. Time is precious. You know, time is precious. Just ask some of these veterans up here, you know, all these guys and and gals serve with other people who saw some bad things happen. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow, you know. Don't waste time. Time is a commodity. You'll never get today back. Make the most of it. Take your next step with, with eternal things, with the things that matter most. Take that next step today. So let's all stand. Let me pray for you as we go into a time of response and commitment. Father God, we are just so thankful that you love us. Jesus, so thankful that you came and died in our place that we may have salvation and life and forgiveness and hope. Holy Spirit, thank you that you fill us and you lead us to to want to and to do according to your good pleasure. God, we just pray right here this morning that um, that you would give us the faith, the courage to take the next step, whatever that next step is. God, for some, it may be to trust in you, Jesus, as Lord and Savior. Lord, give them the faith they need, the boldness to take that step and trust you with their whole life for all of eternity. God, for some from baptism, help them to take that next step. Maybe they're, maybe they're a little scared of being in front of people, or maybe um, there's something that's just kind of been holding them back. God, I pray you would just just knock down all the obstacles. Because God, we know you want them to obey. We we know you want them to follow you. And baptism is such a big step of publicly declaring that I am a follower of Jesus. It will help many here and watching to take that step. God, for some, maybe the next step is to join a church family. Again, we're all a little afraid of commitments because maybe we've been burned in the past at some commitments. But God, help us to trust you, to take you at your word and and just to go all in with a local church family. God, maybe for others, it's family related. Being a better dad, a mom, better husband or a wife, being a better child, 
more obedient to parents, more honoring of parents. Maybe, maybe it's a better boss or maybe it's a better employee. God, all of us, all of us have so much room to grow. So just help us to take whatever you're speaking to our heart and to do that more and more for your glory. So God, we give this time to you. Use it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.